Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to talk about whether I think John Lennon had made it up with his former bandmates by the time he was killed. So I'll st I'm going to mainly go on primary sources, although I might mention a couple of rumours and stuff. Um, and I'm going to start off with the easy one, which is Ringo, because Ringo and John never really fell out at all uh, in the aftermath of the breakup. So Ringo was on John's first solo album, played on Yoko's 71 Fly album, and John was on Ringo's Ringo album and Goodnight Vienna and Roger Graveur. And then just a month, less than a month before he died, um, John met up with Ringo in, in a hotel in New York City with Yoko and Barbara, and they spent a joyous three hours together, um, got on really well, and John promised to come and work on Ringo's upcoming album, which was going to be Stop and Smell the Roses, and at the time it was called You Can't Fight Lightning, and he was going to go in in, in January 81 and help Ringo, but obviously that didn't happen, unfortunately. But So Ringo and John remained firm friends throughout the 70s. Um, Next, we'll cover the topic of George. Now, whereas John and Paul were the main ones that fell out over the split, there was some tension between John and George, particularly because George took a disliking to Yoko and told Yoko to her face that she gave off bad vibes at the time of her coming in in the Apple days. And John said in an interview, I don't know why I didn't hit him. Uh, but having said that, they managed to patch things up because George came to work on John's Imagine album, <coughs> 1971, <coughs> and they nearly got together for the concert of Bangladesh, but they kind of fell out over that because George didn't want Yoko to perform, so John got the hump with that, and uh, they fell out pretty badly by all accounts, and whereas they did meet up in December 74, uh, just in the middle of George's tour, and there's an interview you can listen to on YouTube, a radio interview. Uh, George was, John was planning to play as a guest on George's tour in the same way as he just guested for Elton, but he didn't end up playing because they had an argument. And then after that, there's no documented meetings between John and George before John's death. Um, although there's a rumor, which was in the Keith Badman book, but I think even he is a little unsure of of himself on this one, that uh, John Yoko flew to Los Angeles for a Monty Python concert in 1980, September, and met George. But if that is true, why have there not been any photos of that? And I find that a bit hard to believe, to be honest. Um, and after John died, George was interviewed and, and once said, I hadn't seen him for, for a few years before. And every time I did see him, I got the feeling from his eyes that he was trying to escape from something, but he couldn't because of the situation he was in, which was a pretty thinly veiled attack on his relationship with Yoko. So <clears throat> in 1980, in the Playboy interviews, John publicly says how he's hurt um, about George not mentioning him in his autobiography. And uh, he says, George put out a book privately and I was hurt by it. So this message will go out to him by glaring omission in the book. My influence on his life is absolutely zilch and nil, not mentioned. In, the, in his book, which is purport, purportedly his, his clarity of vision on each song he wrote and its influences, he, remember, he, remembers, <coughs> excuse me, he remembers every two-bit sax player or guitarist he met in subsequent years. I'm not in the book. Why, says Playboy? Because George's relationship with me was one of young follower and older guy. He's three or four younger than me, three or four years younger than me. It's a love-hate relationship, and I think George still bears resentment toward me for being a daddy who left home. He would not agree with this, but that's my feeling about it. I was just hurt. I was just left out as if I didn't exist. So that, when George heard that, I think just before John died, the interview came out, or he heard a snippet. I think it, the news got to, jo to George somehow, and he tried to phone the hit factory where John was recording Double Fantasy, but uh, the call was not taken. So they didn't actually speak, I don't think. So that, they, I think John and George actually parted, um, John, when John died, George, John, John and George were not particularly um, 
made up from that particular row. But having said that, um, later on in the book, uh, John quite rightly says, I'd like to clarify that. You see, I'm slightly resentful of George's book, but don't get me wrong, I still love those guys. The Beatles are over, but John, Paul, George and Ringo go on. I mean, just because I'm upset about George's book doesn't mean that's all I feel. Do you understand? I like them and it's over. Get it? Brackets laughing. I don't want to start another whole thing between me and George just because of the way I feel today. Tomorrow I will feel absolutely differently. It's not important anyway. I don't feel that or anything only about him or any of them. It's very complicated and there are lots of a lot of mixed emotions about all of them. That's why it's difficult to say anything. I don't want to come off niggling. It's stupid in as much as the repercussions are not worth some sort of offhand remarks about each other. So that puts it into perspective. Um, now we'll come on to the relationship be between John and Paul, obviously with, the, with Paul taking the others to court to dissolve the Beatles partnership. In January of 71, that highly strained the relations and uh, then he put out Ram, which had some subtle digs at John and Yoko and the other three, the other two Beatles as well. And then John replied with, how do you sleep? So that was the nadir of their relationship. But gradually, over the coming months and years, they began to make it up, starting with dear friend Paul's Olive Branch from Wildlife. And then John and Yoko met Paul and Linda at their Bank Street apartment in New York City down in the village in December, late December 71, and had quite a nice time apparently, agreed to stop slagging each other off in the press. And then we've got Let Me Roll It from Band on the Run, which was, again, another kind of olive branch towards John. So Paul quite rightly didn't answer How Do You Sleep with a similar nasty song. He, he preferred to extend the hand of friendship, and I think that was the right move. Um, John then later described Band on the Run as good Paul music, and they met together in 1974. The thumbnail for this video is a picture of them with Paul having a moustache in 74 during the Lost Weekend period with Harry Nielsen and Keith Moon as well in attendance. And then John saw quite a lot of Paul, uh, as you can read in the May Pang book, uh, Loving John, 74, 75 period. And then even when John got back together with Yoko, Paul and Linda turned up at the Dakota in December 75, just before New Year, and spent an evening. And then in March 76, um, they also did the same. And uh, so they were actually watching TV together when the offer from Saturday Night Live came that if you come down to the studio, we'll give you some laughable sum, like $3,000 um, for appearing on the show. And it was kind of a joke. and. And, uh, oh yeah, Paul and I were together watching that show, says John. He was visiting at our place uh, at our place in the Dakota. We were watching it. Almost went down to the studio just as a gag. We nearly got into a cab. We were actually too tired. How did you and Paul happen to be watching TV together? There was a period when Paul just kept turning up at the door with a guitar. I would let him in, but finally I said to him, please Paul, call before you come over. It's not 1956 and turning up at the door isn't the same anymore. You know, just give me a ring. He was upset by that, but I didn't mean it badly. I just meant that I was taking care of the baby all day and some guy turns up at the door. But anyway, back on the night, he and Linda walked in and he, he and I were just sitting there watching the show and we went, ha ha, wouldn't it be funny if we went down, but we didn't. Is that the last time you've seen Paul? Yes, but I didn't mean it like that. So that was nice. Uh, that March 76, the last time John met Paul. But I think they, according to Paul, they, they've spoke on the phone and... Obviously, after John's son was born, they and then J James, uh, Paul had a son in September '77. So they had that in common in the last few years of their life, and they think they used to talk about domestic stuff and you know bringing up children. And as long as they stayed off Apple, they were on quite amicable terms. Um, then we've got the January 1980 phone call where Paul fought, phoned the Dakota and couldn't get through to John. He wanted to meet up with John to share some uh, some marijuana with him, but uh, Yoko did, wouldn't let John speak to Paul. So then he went on to Japan and promptly got busted. Um, all kinds of rumors, conspiracy theories about Yoko having a hand in that, but I don't think that's the case. Uh, later on in 1980, coming up, 
was admired by John in this book, The Playboy Interviews, and also according to Fred Seaman in his book. Um, then in October 1980, Ringo and Paul were in France recording for Ringo's album, and allegedly they spoke to John over the phone, but I can't necessarily verify that. Um, but I do know that John was going to um, guest on Ringo's album, as I said earlier. Um, and then we've got this other remark from John, uh, the last gasp remark, where he was going through the Beatles songs in the Playboy interviews and he says, um, uh, he's each asked about e each song, Playboy, Long and Winding Road, Paul again. He had a little spurt just before we split. I think the shock of Yoko and what was happening gave him a creative spurt, including Let It Be and Long, Long and Winding Road, because that was the last gasp from him. And that was re repeated to Paul on the Breakfast America show where they were, had Paul and Linda on satellite from their Sussex home. And it was only a second half of November 1980, so only about three weeks before John died. And Paul said, I prefer not to comment about what John says, which was, again, was the right approach. But if you read that remark in context, straight after saying that was the last gasp from him, Playboy asked Sun King, that was a piece of garbage I had around. Dig a pony? Another piece of garbage. So he's slagging off two of his tracks straight after that remark about Paul. So he was quite even-handed. He, he's quite a harsh critic of other people's music and of his own music. So I wouldn't read too much into that last gasp remark. Um, but another thing John says in this interview and others in 1980 is he hadn't really communicated with Paul in 10 years. So they had met up, they had spoken on the phone, but it's my view that they hadn't rekindled their friendship to the extent that they might have liked and Paul regretted that after John died and actually said that that's the last time I will not make it up with someone completely before they die because it leaves all kinds of regrets. Um, Dave Sholin, who did the RKO interview on the day John died, shared a taxi to the recording studio on the way to the, Dave Sholin was on the way to the airport and he asked Paul in the back, of, asked John in the back, back of the cab, how's your relationship with Paul? And Paul and um, John said, we're like brothers, we'd do anything for each other. With Dave Sholin said that was nice to hear. So that indeed was nice to hear on the, John, on the very day that John died. Um, then after John died, we obviously had George's tribute all those years ago, which was very heartfelt, and Paul's tribute here today, where he even managed to say the words, I love you, which I doubt he would have plucked up the courage to say in John's lifetime, because you know they, they grew up in quite a macho Liverpool environment where saying something like that was probably not, uh, not that usual for Liverpool mates, as it were. So yeah, I would say uh, you know the relationships between the, the all four Beatles were quite complicated, but um, they were on reasonable terms by the time John died. John and George perhaps not quite on the best terms. John and Paul, uh, again, as I said, I, they'd started to repair their friendship, but they hadn't really seen each other much. So maybe they would have met up after, if had John not died, we'll never know. But uh, that was my speculation on whether John was on good terms with his ex bandmates when he was uh, shot. So thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>